بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم محمد رسول الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه The relevance of the topic that we're going to talk about I think is self-evident in particular and especially in light of the re uh, recent Danish cartoon controversy of 2005. And what I'm going to do uh, before getting to the actual gist of my topic is to give a little bit of a long introduction talking about miscellaneous issues. The first of these issues before moving on to the academic side of things, many people mistakenly presume that this is an issue of free speech. That what is at stake is the freedom of speech and the right to say what, whatever you want to say. But I want to state quite clearly that this is not the case. The issue of insulting the Prophet ﷺ really has absolutely nothing to do with the freedom of speech, even from a Western perspective. And this is because every single society in the world, every single society, has certain issues that it considers taboo. It considers unmentionable. Sometimes that taboo is legally enshrined, that the government says, you cannot talk about that. And every single country on the face of this earth has laws directed against certain types of speech, libel, slander, hate speech, etc. Sometimes it is not the government that sets these laws. It is societal norms and cultural values. Every single society has certain issues that are simply taboo. You don't talk about them. Or if you do, you must pay a price. Maybe not going to jail, but you will pay a social stigma. You will pay a price of your value being lost in society. For example, in the country that we live in, North America, United States of America, Racist diatribes, speaking ill of African Americans, for example. It's not illegal. You're not going to go to jail if you're a racist. But what is going to happen if you open your mouth and you start criticizing African Americans, stereotyping them, using the N-word? What would happen if any self-respecting politician, dignitary, media person used that word? He wouldn't go to jail. It's not against the law. But such a person, as you all know, what happened to that radio show host when he used a very vulgar or a very evil term? He was stigmatized. He was considered socially ostracized. The company had to fire him. How about the actor that, that plays Kramer on Seinfeld, My, uh, Michael Richards? When he, in, this, in a certain, uh, conf in a certain um, uh, comedy show that he was at, he just went into a diatribe against African Americans, said something downright vulgar and evil. It's not illegal. He didn't end up going to jail. But socially, he was stigmatized to the level that he had to come forth and boldly and, and, and unabashedly say, I was a racist. I made a mistake. He had to basically admit that he made a very evil error. Nobody stood up to defend him and said, oh, you know what? He had the right to say that. Why don't you allow him to express his freedom of, of thought? Nobody did that. Because socially, culturally, it is simply taboo in North America to speak about these topics. Similarly, anti-Semitism is taboo in many countries. You simply cannot speak bad about Jews without facing the social consequences. Holocaust denial. Holocaust denial, ridiculing the Holocaust. In fact, in 13 Western countries that openly claim to be democratic, they're not dictatorships. In 13 European countries, Holocaust denial is a crime that is punishable by being put in jail. You all know a few years ago when the famous uh, band, the Dixie Chicks, when they were performing, I think it was in Germany, I forgot where, when they were performing and they ridiculed President Bush and they said, we're really embarrassed and ashamed that we're from the same state as President Bush's. They didn't go to jail for that. But what happened? Their entire career was literally destroyed overnight. To this day, there is a stigma attached to them. 
Again, it's not that it's illegal. It's that every society, every culture has, as I said, a line that you don't cross. Now, it just so happens that the honor of our Prophet ﷺ doesn't exist beyond that line for them. They have other issues that is beyond that line. But the honor of our Prophet ﷺ, the sanctity of our religion, the holiness of what we deem to be sacred is not beyond that line. Other things are. And so, I want to say it's not an issue of freedom of speech. And I found it very, very ironic that one of the main standard newspapers of America, when the Danish cartoon controversy broke, and I was following this with uh, a, a lot of meticulous care, I found it very ironic that in one day, on the front cover, they were criticizing, they were criticizing the fact that Muslims had a problem with this, that they need to get up and wake up and, and smell the coffee and understand our values. And on the second page, there was another story of a certain person who had uttered racist remarks, and how evil he was, and how he should be banned from public speech and how he had lost his whole face in society. Nobody stood up to call for freedom of speech for that person, even though he was offending a lot of people. So I want to just emphasize as my first introduction that we need to be very blunt about this. We are not asking for such things to be made illegal. I understand that in this country it's not going to be possible. But what we are asking is that they become culturally taboo, self-imposed we'd call it, self-imposed silencing, not legal silencing. And I want to give you another example. And this happened, ironically, after the Danish cartoon controversy by a few months. David Irving, how many of you have heard of David Irving? Not too many. This is a name we need to know as Muslims not to support. I don't support this person at all. But to demonstrate the double standards that exist in the society and culture that we live in. David Irving is a famous, or I should say infamous, historian. He used to teach at Oxford, he has a long resume. And he became infamous because he wrote many books talking about the Holocaust. And saying that this figure of six million is too many. It wasn't six, it was lesser than that. He wasn't denying the Holocaust. What he was doing was questioning the history of the Holocaust. Now I stand here today and I say unequivocally, I do not support David Irving. And I am not a Holocaust denier. I am not. But what I find amazing was that nobody, not one single person, stood up and said, you know what? He's a historian. He should have the right to write his books and papers. Nobody did that. And in fact, laws were passed against him. As I said, there are 13 countries that have anti-Holocaust laws, not just to deny, to question the figure 6 million. If somebody says, no, there were in fact 5.5 million, some countries would put you in jail for that. And so it so happened that the Jews of all of these countries took David Irving to court, even though he wasn't living there. And, and the court all ruled with the Jews of those countries, so much so that when David Irving visited the country of Austria, a democratic, a secular, a Western country, Austria had already passed a law against him. The court case had already been closed and shut. He was guilty. And so as he stood up to deliver his speech in Austria, lo and behold, the police came. He's a British citizen. The police came and arrested him and put him in jail where he remained for almost one year. For what crime? For what crime? For daring to question the figures of the Holocaust. Once again, I state unequivocally, I am not supporting David Irving in what he said. I am not, but what I am questioning, why is it that not a single organization, no major media outlet from the New York Times to the Washington Post, nothing stood up and said, hey look, guys, it's just something he said. Allow him the freedom of speech. Why isn't he allowed to say what he wants to say? He's being put in jail in a foreign country as a British citizen being jailed in Austria simply because he wrote an academic book about the Holocaust. And he remained in jail for almost one year until finally when he was released, he learned his lesson and now he's hiding in his house not saying anything at all. He doesn't want to go back to jail again. Again, we're not supporting somebody like that. Neither are we supporting racists, neither are we supporting anybody of their ilk. But what we are pointing out is something called double standards. 
Why is it that when we criticize those who make fun of our Prophet ﷺ, we're labeled intolerant, we're labeled backward, we're labeled this and that, and yet all of these people, when they say things that are, in all honesty, less insulting to the people who follow this religion, the Prophet ﷺ, no matter how much, we all, of course, are against the Holocaust, but it's not making fun of Musa ﷺ, it's not making fun of their Prophet, and no doubt for the Yahud, their Prophet and their God is more sacred to them than any historical event. Similarly for us, our Prophet, our God, our book is more sacred and holy for us than any historical incident. And so this person is put in jail and nobody supports him. Everybody is for the fact that he should be punished. Every single person. So the double standards are quite clear. And I think that if we want to get involved in this area, in this arena, we need to be very aware that every society has its zone, that they feel comfortable poking a few jokes here and there, and then there are self-imposed lines that respectful, respectable members of any society simply cannot cross. And if they do cross it, they have, to, they have to face the consequences, if not legally, at least socially. And I just want to point out before I move on, that... 50 years ago, or 100 years ago, it was possible to say things about African Americans that you can't say now. It was possible to say things about our theological cousins of the Yehud that you cannot say now. What happened? They worked, they strived, they made it such that those issues become taboo. 100 years ago, what did politicians say about African Americans? Not even 150 years ago. The governor of Alabama, when Martin Luther King was giving him his freedom speech 45 years ago. The governor of Alabama was an open racist. Open racist. Nobody can do that anymore. Why? Because the African Americans worked hard. They made sure that these issues become culturally taboo, even if they're legally permissible. The same applies to the Jews. A hundred years ago, fifty years ago, Henry Ford said some things about the Jews that are considered very anti-Semitic. And he published books and magazines about them. This is fifty, sixty years ago. Look what happened to him, hardly anything. Because the time was different. What did the Jews do? What did the Yehud do? They, they fought, they strove, they educated the people, and they made these issues culturally taboo. So we as Muslims need to do the same thing. It's not, we're not asking for laws to be passed, at least I am not, because I understand the, the, the freedom of speech as it works in this country, we're not going to get any laws passed. What we are asking is cultural sensitivity. Be that as the case is, the question arises, what do we do in the light of such harsh attacks? I think that every one of us sitting here today, I think that we all understand that reacting emotionally is not just un-Islamic, it's counterproductive. I think that none of us here justifies what happened in the wake of the Danish cartoon controversy in Pakistan, in Lebanon, in Syria. I think none of us justifies that. We all know bombing a McDonald's, no matter how bad their fries are, you don't have to go bomb them. You know, we, we all understand that burning the Danish embassy down is not going to get you anywhere. So I'm not going to talk about that because we all, on this, in this room, we're all on the same wavelength. That is too extreme, that is ridiculous, that is counterproductive. The issue comes about economic boycott, and that is something can be discussed, but that's not, again, the point of this particular uh, panel session. I'm ambivalent about this. I know that many Middle Eastern countries boycotted Danish products. They said that it had an impact. Again, uh, that's an another topic uh, that we need to think about. The issue of reacting in the media, these are all areas that need to be discussed, but that's not the discussion of this panel. The discussion of this panel is the academic response. There are multifaceted responses, please be aware of that. What we're talking about right now, in the next 45 minutes or so, is the academic response. So I'd like to begin by Islamically contextualizing such attacks. And these attacks, by the way, are called ad hominem attacks. Ad hominem means you're attacking the messenger instead of the message. You're attacking the persona rather than what he says. These types of attacks realize my fellow Muslim brothers and sisters, that this is the general trend of all the Prophets before our Prophet wasallam, and including our Prophet wasallam, That they were rejected, they were ridiculed, they were mocked, they were made fun of by their own peoples before other peoples. The famous story in Surah Yasin, which all of you know, 
when the person is killed by his own people and he says ya hasratan ala al-ibad ma ya'tihim min rasulin illa kanu bihi yastahzi'un oh woe to these servants of god why is it that every time a messenger comes to them they have to ridicule and mock him ma ya'tihim min rasul never does a prophet come except that they end up yastahzi'un making fun of him cracking jokes at him mocking him in other verses in the quran allah subhanahu wa ta'ala consoles our prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by telling him that many were the prophets that came before you and all of them were ridiculed and mocked in many verses including surah al-an'am verse 10 surah 13 verse 32 surah 21 verse 41 allah subhanahu wa ta'ala consoles our prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam وَلَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا رُسُلًا مِنْ قَبْلِكَ We have sent many prophets before you. Many were the men that came before you. And what happened to them? اِسْتُهْزِئَ They were mocked and ridiculed. They were talked about in a very mean and contemptuous fashion. And the reason that I began the academic uh, uh, talk with this point is to remind ourselves that this is not a new phenomenon. Rather, it goes back to the earliest of times. The very first messenger of Allah, Nuh alayhi salam, he was mocked severely by his people. He was building something they had never seen in their lives. He was building a ship in the middle of a desert. He was building this structure that he claimed could float on water. And they had never seen a ship. Remember, Nuh alayhi salam was the first human being to build a ship. And so Allah azza wa jal tells us, Kullama marra alayhi, Every time a person went by him, he mocked Nuh alayhi salam. Every single time any person went by Nuh alayhi salam, he laughed at him and he joked him at him. And this happened for Allah knows how many hundreds of years. Similarly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that the Prophet Shu'aib alayhi salam was called a madman, a lunatic. That the Prophet Hud alayhi salam was mocked because his people said, all of your followers are nothing but shepherds. Your followers are the lowest of the low. Why should we respect you? Every single prophet was mocked in a unique and specific way. And that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in surah 15 verse 95, Inna kal mustahzi'in. We will take care of those who ridicule and mock you. We will take care of them. We will deal with them. No matter what you do, Ya Rasulullah, you will not be able to counter their effects. Leave it to us. We will take care of them. And the Quran tells us that even in the lifetime of the Prophet Wasallam, a number of charges were laid against him. That he was a liar, that he was a madman, that he was a poet, that he was taught by others. These are the four main charges, by the way. That he was a liar, that he was a madman, that he was a poet, and that he was taught by others. The four main charges that the Qur'an mentions. And just as a footnote, it is absolutely amazing to me as a researcher in Orientalist institutions studying uh, with, uh, with non-Muslim academics, it is absolutely amazing that to this day, the only things they can say about our Prophet are one of these four. They cannot go beyond this. To this day, they cannot invent something other than these four things to discredit his message. And Allah Azza wa Jal mentioned it from day one. Allah mentioned it in the Quran and defended him against these four charges. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that this is something standard in the past. And you know what? He also tells us it will happen in the future. Allah tells us it's happening in the past. It happened in the past. And Allah warns us in the Quran, O oh Muslims, it's going to happen in the future. It will happen in your time. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Ali Imran, verse 186, Surah Ali Imran, verse 186, Allah says, وَلَا تَسْمَعُنَّ مِنَ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُ وَمِنَ الَّذِينَ أَشْرَكُوا أَذَنْ كَثِيرًا He is addressing us. And He says, And of a surety you will hear, you will hear from the Jews and Christians and the pagans, i.e. the rest of mankind who's left, all other religions, you will hear from them much that will cause you hurt, hurt and grief. Adha. It's going to cause you a lot of hurt and pain. What is the response? 
وَإِن تَصْبِرُوا وَتَتَّقُوا فَإِنَّ ذَلِكَ مِنْ عَزْمِ الْأُمُورِ If you are patient and you have piety of Allah, if you are patient and you have piety of Allah, that is the best methodology. Azm al-umur, that is the best way to proceed. So, contextualizing these attacks, it's nothing new. It will happen just like it happened in the past. Moving on, ca categorizing these attacks. We contextualize them. Point two, categorizing these attacks. Realize that there are many avenues of attacking our Prophet wasallam. And we are concentrating in this talk on attacks against his character and persona. There are other ways of attacking Islam, to attack the Qur'an, to attack theology, to attack Sharia. Ah. All of them have their own defense. In this panel, we're concentrating on attacks to the persona, to the nature, to the character of our Prophet ﷺ. Such attacks can generally be char characterized in one of three categories. The first of these categories, number one, outright lies, sheer fabrications, absolutely no historical basis whatsoever. And there are many examples of this. For example, the charge that the Prophet ﷺ suffered from epilepsy, that he would go into seizures and fits when the wahi came down. This is utter fabrication that was started in the Middle Ages by uh, the Spanish Christians. Another example that the Prophet Sallallahu died in the year 666 of the Christian era. And this was propounded by, uh, amongst other people, Peter the Venerable, uh, the, the abbot of Cluny who was very active in spreading false information about Islam. And the first person to think of translating the Quran into a Western language. Peter, uh, the, Peter the Venerable was the first person to find others to translate the Qur'an into Latin, not to defend it, not to give da'wah, but to critique it. And of the things that he spread is that the Prophet died in the year 666. What is this got to tell you? Who can tell me? What is 666? The number of the beast. And so he claimed that the Prophet was, uh, was the Antichrist. Another outright lie, which was very common in much of uh, the Middle Ages, is that the Muslims worship the Prophet wasallam, that his name is not Muhammad but Mahund. And in fact, in many books written, even by famous English and British writers in the 13th, 14th century, we find that the Prophet is referred to as Mahund, because Mahund is the name of a devil. And so they distort in Christian theology. So they distort the name of Muhammad وسلم, and they say his name is Mahund. Another outright lie which has become so common, it is now an expression in the English language which people use to this day. That expression is, if the mountain does not come to Muhammad, that Muhammad will go to the mountain. This is a common expression meaning that if the situation doesn't work out the way I wanted, I will adapt to the situation. That's an expression now. What is the basis of this expression? There is a lie that was fabricated first by uh, the famous Francis Bacon, uh, the famous British author who wrote in 1625, uh, where basically he said that the Prophet ﷺ challenged the Quraysh that the mountain will come to him. And so he issued the challenge and the mountain didn't move. And so the Quraysh began to ridicule and mock him. And so he said, very well, if the mountain will not come to me, I will go to the mountain and beat the challenge in that way. Of course, this is a sheer fabrication. No such story ever happened. But it has become legendary in many books until, as I said, it is an expression uh, in the English language. So the first category, outright lies. And this category was very common in the Middle Ages in the 17th, 18th century, but with the advent of uh, the modern universities, with the advent of more uh, interaction with Muslims, these types of lies are getting rarer and rarer. And for those of you who are interested, there's a very interesting book by uh, Minau Reeves, M-I-N-O-U-R-E-E-V-E-S, uh, called Muhammad in Europe, A Thousand Years of Western Myth-Making. Muhammad in Europe, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, A Thousand Years of Western Myth-Making, uh, published by the NYU Press in 2003, and it gives you a lot of these uh, lies. The second category of attacks are distorted truths. They are not lies, but something is factual. And then certain elements are read in. Certain things are added. Certain flavors are put in, which twist the entire thing around. 
and realize that there is always a negative way of representing the same fact. The glass is half empty or half full, both are true. How do you want to look at it? And the best example of this in our own sources is that of the woman who came to complain about her husband to the Prophet ﷺ. Famous story, famous hadith in Sahih Bukhari. The woman comes and complains and she says, Ya Rasulullah, my husband beats me when I pray. He forces me to break my fast, doesn't allow me to fast, and he misses fajr regularly. So the Prophet ﷺ called him, called the husband. He didn't just base his verdict on what the wife said. Actu actually, if the husband is just like that, it's like Abu Dhabi is like doing kufr. I mean, he doesn't want his wife to pray or fast, he doesn't pray for himself. So the Prophet ﷺ called the man. And the man said, Ya Rasulullah, I am a young man. I come home from the fields and my wife is standing in prayer. I want the dinner to be ready. I want this and that there. So I, I tell her to shorten the prayer. And she's fasting every single day. And I would like to be a husband to her on these days. And she doesn't have to fast nothing fast. She can fast in Ramadan. So that's why I don't want her to pray long. I don't want her to, to do extra nafil fasts. And so the Prophet ﷺ said, Yes, okay, nafil fasts are your husband's right. He can let you fast and he can prevent you from fasting. And you don't have to pray Surah Al-Baqarah in your salah. You can read Surah Al-Ikhlas as well. No big deal. So the Prophet ﷺ sided with the husband. The third issue of Fajr. The husband said, Ya Rasulullah, we are a family known for having a sleep problem. In other words, I try to wake up, but it's something we are known that we don't wake up uh, with, except with great difficulty. And so the Prophet ﷺ said, if you really slept, overslept Fajr, pray as soon as you wake up. In other words, if it's something you try to wake up and... So basically, the Prophet ﷺ sided with the husband in all three issues. Now the question arises, did the wife lie? The response is no. The wife was truthful. The wife was absolutely truthful, but it is a matter of perspective. And so, similarly, if this can happen with good Muslim couples, as we all know who are married here, definitely happens all the time. If this can happen with good Muslim couples, how about when somebody doesn't have Iman, and they read into the seerah? Of course they will distort. Of course they will change and twist. Not that they're going to lie. They will simply look at it in a twisted angle. And there are once again many examples here. For example... It is a common claim that the Prophet ﷺ, in the early Medinan phase resorted to highway robbery. That he would stand on the road or, not, or basically uh, hide himself with the Sahaba on the road and every time a caravan went, he would just attack and rob them and take their goods and belongings. Now, initial response, A'udhu Billah, this is totally false. But you go and you look up and you find out, no, it's not totally false. It's just distorted. The Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba never attacked caravans unconditionally. They attack the Quraysh. There's a big difference. There's a big difference to say that he used to attack caravans all over Arabia and he used to attack the Quraysh. The Quraysh, yes, definitely. The Sahaba would definitely find out where they're heading and attack their caravans. Why? Because of 13 years of oppression, because of being expelled from their own countries and lands, because of confiscating their property. The Quraysh expelled the Muslims, took over all their money. The Sahaba had no money when they left for Medina, the Muhajirun. These people wronged us, we have the right to do this back to them. Only. The Sahaba never attacked caravans of other tribes. Only the Quraysh. So it's a factual statement that has been distorted. Another example that the Prophet ﷺ orchestrated a mini holocaust of the Jews of Medina specifically the Banu Quraydah once again yes indeed it is true that these Jews of the Banu Quraydah were executed but nobody gives you the details why they were accused of treason they were accused in the battle of the Ahzab the battle of the trench of trying to plot within the city to overthrow the Muslims that is treason when they're surrounded by 10,000 of the Quraysh, 10,000 of the pagan armies. And within Medina, all of a sudden, the, 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 the Banu Quraydah revolts. And the Banu Quraydah tries to instigate a, a, an internal, a fifth column. And they almost succeeded if Allah Azza wa Jal had not shown their plot. Of course, treason in almost every country has extremely harsh punishments. And so the punishment given to them was not because they were Jews, it was because they committed treason. It had nothing to do with their ethnicity, with their religion. So this is true, but the way it's distorted, the way it's presented is a half-truth. Likewise, the claim that the Prophet ﷺ was initially very fond of the Christians and Jews, but later on scorned them. Factually, this is true. Initially, the Prophet 
was fond of the Christian Jews, but why? Because he was hoping that because they are people of the book, they would recognize him as a prophet. And so he was optimistic that these people will follow me. Instead, when they tried to kill him, on more than three occasions, the Yahud tried to kill him. When they rejected his message with the utmost severity, when they sided with the pagans, when they said to the pagans and the idol worshippers, as the Quran tells us, they told the idol worshippers, you are more rightly guided than these monotheists. The, the Yahud said to those who worship idols, this is a verse in the Quran, you are more rightly guided than those who worship Allah alone. This was their animosity. So yes, of course, eventually the Prophet ﷺ cut off all ties with them. All of this are distorted truths, half lies. It's a matter of perspective. So when you hear something like this, our job becomes like the job of the husband. When the wife come, came and complained, you contextualize. You give a frame of reference. And the third critique, we said there is two, right? Number one, outright lies. Number two, distorted truths. Number three, and this is perhaps the most difficult, attacking the cultural norms of the time, attacking societal values that might have been acceptable in 7th century Arabia, but are not acceptable in 21st century America. And this is really the most difficult, uh, this is the most difficult type of, uh, uh, of critique to defend because the average human being is not an expert in sociology, in history, in ethics, the average human being simply thinks the cultural norms of his or her civilization are the correct cultural norms and values. And they don't realize that cultural norms and values change from time to place. The values of, of uh, post-Victorian England are radically different than the values of 21st century America. The sexual mores of America 200 years ago radically differ from the sexual mores of the 21st century of America. These things change. And so, 7th century Arabia had its own issues, which were considered permissible by Muslims and non-Muslims back then. The most classic example, slavery. The Qur'an, no doubt, gave a lot of rulings for slavery. But let's be honest, it didn't come and totally ban it. It did ban alcohol. It banned many things. But it didn't banish slavery. It merely gave conditions. Now, in my humble opinion, the word slavery in the English language cannot be used in a positive sentence. And the Arabic concept of riqqa, of, of, uh, of, of servitude, of slavery, is radically different than the Western concept of slavery. And so I think we are fighting a losing battle if we go into this tangent and try to defend it, for example. We just gloss it over and say that was something that happened in the past. Islam doesn't require slaves to exist. It's not a necessary condition. So these are cultural values. Another thing uh, which we don't have time to talk about, but is definitely something very important, marrying Aisha at a young age, at the age of nine, for example. Okay, and I firmly believe, by the way, that Aisha radiallahu anha was nine years old. I know that there are other opinions out there, and there's people trying to say that she was 18, 19. I think that historically speaking, it's quite clear that she was nine years old. And if we open this door of trying to change our history, uh, we, we're getting into other problems, which I might talk about in question and answer. In any case, the fact that the Prophet married Aisha at the age of nine, none of the enemies of Islam found this problematic. Abu Jahl, Abu Talib, if there was a lot, I mean, none of the enemies of Islam found this problematic. It was culturally acceptable. Just like 200, 300 years ago, it was absolutely acceptable for a 14 year old girl to get married. Romeo and Juliet, do you know how old Juliet is in the play? She's 14 years old. Romeo is 15. This is in Shakespeare's time. In Shakespeare's time, Romeo and Juliet are 14 and 15 years old. And to him, this is something culturally acceptable. In our times, that's something, it's taboo, you just don't do that. Imagine if in Shakespeare's time, it was 14 and 15, backtrack another thousand years, the age of nine, the age of 10, was a mature age for those climates, for those cultures. It's a cultural value that has changed. Aisha, when she was nine years old, was very similar to what we would consider a 16, 17 year old of our generation, intellectually, mentally, uh, and so forth. So this is a cultural value that they are attacking. And it is very difficult to defend because you usually need a little bit of intelligence in the person you're talking to. The person you're talking to needs to understand that culture changes. And many people don't understand that. So that is definitely one of the biggest challenges uh, that happens. Um, I wanted to conclude, these are the three primary uh, modes of attack. I wanted to conclude by giving some examples, some lengthy examples. We only have 10 minutes, I'll try to summarize them. The first example 
And by the way, I've given three tactics. I'm not being exclusive. These are the primary three tactics. Also, most of the time, an attack about the, against the honor of our Prophet ﷺ is a combination of these three. It's not that only one is used. A story is invented, bits of fabrication, bits of distorted truths, bits of cultural values, and then presented. And so an example of this, one example, in a little bit of detail. The story of Zainab binti Jahsh and the Prophet's marriage to Zainab. Now, Zainab bint Jahsh was the cousin of the Prophet ﷺ, and she was married to Zayd. And Zayd was the adopted son of the Prophet ﷺ. As you all know, he had adopted Zayd. And so he was called Zayd ibn Muhammad. And just like in our culture, in our culture, American culture, Adopted children and biological children are considered the same. Morally, I'm saying. Morally. If you try to say, no, no, there's a difference, morally society will say, oh, you're being so mean. You're being so unfair. Cultural values, once again. Islamically, Islamically, in the beginning period of Islam, it was the same. Adopted children, biological children are the same. And so when the Prophet ﷺ adopted Zayd, his name became Zayd ibn Muhammad. And the wife of Zayd, i.e. Zainab, became the daughter-in-law of the Prophet ﷺ. And as you all know, daughter-in-laws are permanent mahram. Even if the marriage breaks between the son and the wife, the father-in-law always remains a mahram. This is a strange thing, subhanAllah. The husband becomes a non-mahram after the divorce. The husband becomes a non-mahram because after the divorce is over. But the father-in-law remains a mahram forever. So, in this case, when Zayd, when Zayd and Zainab were married, the Prophet ﷺ eventually ended up marrying Zainab. What is the Orientalist version? The Orientalists all agree. There is pretty much ijma, unanimous consensus amongst them. That the version of events goes as follows. The Prophet ﷺ allegedly fell in love with Zainab. Uh, he went to visit her in her house. And he opened the, or she opened the door and she was wearing clothes that typically she would wear when she's sleeping. In other words, not fully dressed up. And that the Prophet ﷺ saw her beauty and was imp impressed by that and fell in love with her. And when Zayd heard about this, then he divorced his wife so that uh, the Prophet ﷺ could marry, uh, could marry her. And Allah Azza wa Jal conveniently revealed according to them verses that talk about adopted children are not real children and you can marry their wives. This is the non-Muslim version of events. That the Prophet ﷺ, a'udhu billah, saw Zainab dressed, in a, uh, dressed inappropriately, fell in love with her at first sight, and wanted to marry her. So he concocted these verses to say that uh, adopted children are not biological children. The problem with this sequence of events is that it is presented as undisputed fact from within the Islamic tradition. It's as if this is the only version of events. Yet the fact of the matter is that this version is only one version of the story. And let us call this, for lack of a better term, the love story version. There are other versions that exist in classical and medieval texts which are generally considered more acceptable and more authentic. In fact, Sahih al-Bukhari, Tafsir ibn Kathir, Tafsir, uh, or the Seerah ibn Ishaq, all of the standard references present a very different picture. Before we get into who's right and wrong, don't you think it's hypocritical for a non-Muslim to come and pounce on the most sensationalist story and ignore all the other versions and then not even tell you the other versions exist? Not even question the fact that there are other versions of the story? Let me give you for example, the earliest tafsir is written, tafsir of Abdul Razak in 211, tafsir of Ibn Abi Hatim in 327, uh, the, tafsir, the tafsir of uh, Ibn Kathir, the earliest seerah books written, seerah of Ibn Ishaq, uh, the earliest hadith books written, the, the hadith of uh, the Sahih of, of Imam Bukhari, all of these books give a radically different story. What is the story there? The story there is that the Prophet wasallam was informed by Allah that eventually Zainab would be his wife. And Zayd and Zainab began having arguments and disputes. Zayd did not want to remain married to Zainab. So Zayd came to the Prophet ﷺ wanting a divorce. 
And the Prophet ﷺ felt awkward because he knew that when that divorce takes place and the idda is over, Zainab would become his wife and he himself did not like the cultural taboo of marrying a supposed daughter-in-law. So he told Zayd, Ittaqillah, fear Allah and don't divorce her. He told Zayd not to divorce her and he feared men's criticism of this cultural taboo. Not that he had love of Zainab, Rather, he was embarrassed at marrying a supposed daughter-in-law. So he wanted to stall it. Zayd wanted a divorce. This is the version of Sahih Bukhari. And the Prophet says, no, you stay with her. Don't divorce her. And Allah Azza wa Jal then revealed verses in Surah Ahzab. Why were you scared of the people? The Prophet this is the verse in the Quran. Why were you scared of the people? nas. It is more befitting that you are scared of Allah. Shouldn't be embarrassed at the people's statements. There is no love story in Sahih Bukhari, in Ibn Kathir, in Sahih, all of these books. The question arises, where does this love story exist? Response, again we're getting a little bit academic here, but it exists in a tafsir called Tafsir Muqatir ibn Sulaiman. And Muqatir ibn Sulaiman by unanimous consensus is not a scholar, he's not a historian, he is a storyteller. He is a storyteller. In other words, he's a tabloid paper. He's not the New York Times. Literally, he's a tabloid paper. So the Orientalists, imagine, and I, I said this at an academic conference when I was defending the story uh, in, in a certain context. I said, imagine walking into uh, a bookstore, walking into a supermarket, and ignoring the New York Times, ignoring you know, the Washington Post, ignoring every single reputable, the Times Magazine, Newsweek, and getting your news from the Daily Inquirer, for example. This is the equivalent of what these people are doing. They ignore every single authentic, legitimate book, and they go to the most obscure references. How many of you have even heard of Tafsir Muqatir ibn Sulaiman? Yes, it exists. It's not a fabrication. Meaning the book is not a fabrication. What's inside it might be. But the book itself, it exists. How many of you are aware of it? Nobody. But these guys hunt down these stories, extract them, and popularize them. So this is one example there are many other examples as well, which we don't have time to get into. Just one sentence about the second incident is that of the satanic verses, the, the infamous satanic verses. Firstly, even the name satanic verses, it is a Western invention. It is not found in the Islamic sources by this name. The, uh, the name in Islamic sources is Qistat al gharaniq or the story of the birds. And Sir William Muir, who is one of the famous uh, Scottish Orientalists, died in 1905. He was the first person to give it the name Satanic Verses. And he popularized it, and it is now considered a fact in non-Muslim circles. To dare deny this fact, it's considered to be you're just being an overzealous Muslim. You're not academically fair. They've already made up their minds about it. Even though, once again, this story is not found in any of the famous books of hadith. It's not found in any of the reputable sources of our history. It's found in obscure works. And it is now considered to be a complete fact. And I've talked about this in more detail uh, in a CD of mine. I don't have time to discuss it now. In conclusion, and to summarize before I hand it over to uh, my dear and esteemed uh, mentor and friend, Sheikh Hasib Rajas, the key points that I'd like to leave you with are three. Firstly, there is a general trend in the history of not just our ummah, of all ummahs, that prophets and righteous men are ridiculed in one way or another. And it is psychologically gratifying for those who reject the message to reject it based upon rejecting the messenger rather than the message. When you cannot attack the message, you begin to attack the messenger. It is something that is intellectually easy, psychologically gratifying, and to be honest, intellectuals don't use this attack. You, you deal with the message, La ilaha illallah, Jannah, Tawheed, Akhirana, this is what you deal with. But to attack the messenger instead of the message is a tactic that has always been used by the riffraff, by the people, by the masses. It's nothing new. So realize this. Secondly, the general rule of the Quran is that we respond to such vitriolic attacks with kindness and intelligence and piety. This is the general rule. We respond by showing we are the better of the two. We respond like Allah Azza wa Jalla says, وَجَادِلْهُمْ بِالَّتِهِ أَحْسَنْ Argue with them in the best manner. And if you cannot respond with nobility, then my advice is do not respond, period. 
if you cannot respond with nobility and akhlaq, then do not respond. And that is exactly what Allah Azza wa Jal says, when the average Muslim is uh, offended, when the person comes and tries to ridicule him. وَإِذَا خَاطَبَهُمُ الْجَاهِلُونَ قَالُوا سَلَامًا When the foolish come and they try to argue with them, they say, Salama, peace, I have better things to do with my time. If you cannot respond academically, intellectually, if you cannot respond with akhlaq and manners, don't respond. Just say, Salama. And console yourself with the fact that when you hear these things, your blood boils indeed. But it wasn't just your blood that was boiling. The Prophet do you not think he was affected? Do you not think he was affected by what people said? Allah said to, in, in the Quran to him, Surah Al-Hijr, verses 97 to 100. We know that your heart is constricted because of what they say. The Prophet he felt narrow, he felt a constriction in his heart. What was the response? فَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ وَكُمْ مِنَ السَّاجِدِينَ Praise your Lord and prostrate to Him. Get involved in the worship of Allah. وَعْبُدْ رَبَّكَ حَتَّى يَأْتِيَكَ الْيَقِينَ And worship Allah until death comes to you. You're not going to respond to every single riffraff. You're not going to respond to every barking dog. Let them bark. You have better things to worry about. This is what our Prophet is told. So don't let it dishearten you to the level that you, pr you, you close your productivity. You do what you can and you aim for higher goals. And the last and final point. If you do respond, do so with academic integrity. Don't change the religion. Don't distort our own history. Because not only is this impermissible and unethical, you're opening up a very, very dangerous door. If you cannot defend except by distorting your own religion, then in all honesty, you are opening up a more evil door than what those people said. If you cannot defend except by distorting or denying what is true, then you are not qualified to defend and leave it to those who are qualified. In conclusion, the final point. I'd like to stress that responding to Orientalist critique is merely one way of defending the honor of the Prophet ﷺ. There are many, many, many ways of defending his honor. And to be brutally honest, the best way to defend the honor of our Prophet ﷺ is not through academic debates, it's not through fancy rhetoric, it's not through meeting people and discussing things with them, but rather through simple and sincere action, through humility, through humbleness, through sincerity, through good akhlaq. The best way to defend the honor of the Prophet ﷺ is to follow his sunnah and to show and to demonstrate to people that indeed our messenger was nothing except a rahmatan lil alameen. Wama arsalnaka illa rahmatan lil alameen. That is the best way to defend the honor of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa ahlu da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala bi Muhammadin wa alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Wa assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.